things far beyond we would even think or imagine. Today we're going to look at one of those great things that happened in the, in the history of the nation of Israel, found there in Joshua chapter 10. If you would turn with me there, I titled the sermon passage to be uh, The Battle Belongs to the Lord, because indeed it truly does, doesn't it? The Battle Belongs to the Lord. So while you're turning there, I found this story I wanted to share with you. It says this. It says that there was a poor, poor country pastor who was livid when he confronted his wife with a receipt for a $250 dress that she had bought. How could you do this, he exclaimed. Well, I don't know, she will. I was standing in the store looking at the dress, and then I found myself trying it on, and it was like the devil was whispering to me, gee, you look great in this dress. You should buy it. Well, the pastor persisted. You know how to deal with him. Just tell him, get behind me, Satan. And she said, I did. But then he said, it looks great from back here, too. <laughs> yeah, I just gave all the women an excuse, didn't I, Brother Doug? Oh, my. That's a cheap dress. <laughs> What's that? A cheap dress. It was an old joke. <laughs> So as funny as that is, it speaks to a truth that we all suffer from, honestly. And, and the truth is that we all want to face battles in our lifetime. I know that one was kind of a small battle, but honestly, we are going to face a battle, whether it's once in a while, occasionally, what I mean by that, or others are going to fight a battle weekly. Some, and most of us probably fall into this category, are going to face a battle every day. Now, I'm not talking about those little day-to-day -day things such as that dress. I was, I was meant to get you to laugh. Or those little things that annoy us like, you know, someone uh, cutting you off in traffic or maybe just bad traffic in general or maybe cleaning up after your kids. Those things can be annoying, but they're not necessarily a battle. Those things are frustrating, but they're not necessarily a battle. Or maybe it, and it, uh, uh, or it could be something such, as easy as trying to figure out what you're going to eat or go to, go to have lunch at. Those aren't necessarily battles. Those are struggles. What I'm talking about with battles are the things that, uh, that, are, that, are, that are devastating. A struggle is trying to pick up something heavy like a, a big rock. It's heavy to do, but it's hard to do for the temporary, but you can do it. A battle is something that's going to have effects on the rest of your life, depending on whether you win or lose that battle that you're in. You think about it this way. Think about an addiction. If you have an addiction and you lose the battle to that addiction, well, what happens? But what happens is you suffer the consequences from that addiction. Whatever they may be, and one of those consequences could be death. And we, we understand that. Some people are addicted to drugs, and they, can, and they don't win the battle to that addiction. And so when they go too far, sometimes that takes their life. So we understand that in the sake, in the sake of a battle. But what about anxiety? There are many people who suffer from anxiety, and that they don't learn how to fight that battle well and control it. But what happens is, well, that, what happens is that they continue with fear for the rest of their life. And none of those places are a very good place to be. So we understand the difference in between a struggle and a battle. The truth is that battles are either won or lost long before they ever happen, though. Have you ever thought about that? Do you believe that? The battles are either won or lost long before you even really engage in them. And you should believe that because battles are either won or lost by what you bring into the battle with you. How prepared you are. Today we're going to see a major battle in the book of Joshua here. When most people think about the book of Joshua, they think about Jericho, and that's true. That's a big part, that's a big battle in the book of Joshua. But then there's another one, and it's this one is found in chapter 10. And, and it, because it's pretty amazing, it's massive. It's, God does some pretty awesome things in the midst of this battle. And there's two verses that I'm going to read this morning. They're going to act like bookends to this chapter 10. And I would like, like, like you to stand with me as I read this. I think I Fran has them on the screen there for us. So, did she get them? Scott, need to put up her on the screen? Yes, sir. Okay. Oh, yeah, they are. I see, my eyes aren't very good. Um, even with glasses. The first one is Joshua chapter 8. This is the first book in, and it says this. <clears throat> and the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear them, for I have given them into your hands. Not a man of them shall stand before you. Then the next one is verse 40, all the way over near the end. And it says, And so Joshua struck the whole land, the hill country, and then the Gib, and the lowlands, and the slopes, and all their kings. He left none remaining, but devoted to destruction all that breathed, notice that last part, just as the Lord God of Israel commanded. Thank you, may be seated. Let's go to the Lord's Prayer. <coughs> Father, as we open your word today, Father, we are thankful for it, Lord. That is, is your sure word of promise, is your sure word of truth, Father. Lord, there is nothing that is wrong with it. It is complete, it is an error, Lord, it has been inspired. 
inspired by you to men, holy men over the years to write things down. And Lord, you have guided us, shaping you, have guided us, influenced the Father, and it's, therefore it is still alive today, and it will never be dead. It will still apply to us today as it applied back then. It is alive and powerful, as, as your word says, Father, and it is sharper than two letters, than any two letters sword. I pray, Father, that let us today do the work that it needs to do, the work of encouragement, Father, to remind us indeed that the battle belongs to you. And Lord, I pray for us, Lord, that you open our eyes and our ears, our minds and our hearts, Lord, to see and hear and then understand with our minds, Lord, and apply to hearts the truths that are here today. And then I pray for myself that, Lord, I can remove myself off the scene and you just speak through me as you see fit, Lord. Let me not say something you don't want me to say, only that what you do. And may it be glorifying to you. Help us to worship you well today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Three points. I'm going to cover today. It's still on the screen up there. Point number one, the preparation for the battle. We talked about that briefly. There is a preparation for every battle, whether we realize it or not. Point number two, God's power in the battle. And then number three, God's provision after the battle. So if you think about the preparations for the battle, see, I was trying to think about how best to, 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 to walk into this as an introduction. And I remembered way, way, way back when I was growing up and my mom was here, she can give testimony to this fact that I played baseball. But I didn't like going to the practices. Do you remember that? I didn't like going to the practices. My mom said, well, you signed up, you're going to have to go. And why did I like going to the practices? Because they were hot. Who likes to go out there and stand in the field when it's hot? And you're not really doing anything. And you're hot and sweaty, and you have to fight off gnats. Because gnats are buzzing around your face while I was waiting for something to happen. And the coach would then make us practice sliding into the bases. And who wants to do that when you know when you're going to slide into the base, you're going to get up and your legs are going to be all bloody because we wore shorts and the coach let us wear shorts. But we knew we had to slide into the bases so we'd get up and have that big old scratch on our leg and it'd be sore for the rest of the week. And, and then the coach would make us get in there to practice hitting the ball. And you know how hard it is to hit the ball every single time. It's very hard. A lot of times you were swinging the bat and miss. And who wants to stand in there and, and be, feel like you've made fun of because you couldn't hit the ball? Most of the time you were hitting just the air as you swung the bat. But why, despite all of these things, and you all may have experienced those or something else, depending on some other sport you may have played growing up or something else, why, despite all those things, do you have to practice? You have to practice in order to learn to win, don't you? The military understands that concept well. Bruce mentioned praying for the veterans. If you ask a veteran today, why did you have to practice military games or whatever it is you did in the Army or the Navy or the Air Force or the Marines, whatever, why did you have to have all these training exercises and what would they say? So we could learn how to fight and win, right? I'm thankful for our veterans because they sacrificed a whole lot for us. If you think about it, they do. They still sacrifice today. As Bruce mentioned, they go through a lot. But you see, the same is true for the life of a Christian when you think about it. God will put us into situations in our lives as a matter of training for future faithfulness. Does that make sense? Future faithfulness. In other words, the things that God puts you in, that puts you through, prepares you for future fruitfulness. Think about it. The Bible talks about we are part of God, we're part of Jesus. He is the vine and we are the branches. And we're going to bear fruit. And we bear fruit as we are what? Prune. You prune a tree so it bears more fruit. Right, Mr. Doug? You hope it does. And if it don't, you cut it down the next year. But we as Christians go through the same thing. We are pruned so that we can bear more fruit in the future. And as painful as that is, sometimes God does that for each and every one of us. Now, if you look at our text of Scripture for today, last week we looked at the Gibeonites and, and their deception of Joshua and Israel. But do you remember what happened at the beginning of that? Someone laughed when I mentioned this last week. I talked about all the ites. Do you remember the ites? Everyone who was an ite was a member of the family, of the various families that lived in the nation of Canaan. Every country that was in Canaan when Israel came in there, they had the, 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 the ending part, I-T-E-S, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hittites, whatever else. They were all ites. And so all these ites... They gathered together, they formed a confederacy to fight against Joshua and Israel. So today we're going to look at those nations briefly. Look at verses 1 through 3 with me. And it says, As soon as Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard how Joshua had captured Ai and had devoted it to destruction, doing to Ai and his king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon, this is them coming into play here, had made peace with Israel and were now among them, he feared. 
What did he do? Well, he feared greatly because Gibeon was a big city, like one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai, and it, all of its men were warriors. So Adonazid, king of Jerusalem, sent to Hoham, king of Hebron, to Piram, king of Jarmuth, to Japhia, king of Lachish. And I have, I'm not making any thing, I'm, I'm not saying I'm pronouncing any of this right, so don't hold that against me. I'm trying my best. To Japhia, king of Lachish, and to Debir, king of Eglon, saying, Come up to me and help me, and let us strike Gibeon. For it has made peace with Joshua and with the people of Israel, and then the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon gathered their forces and went up in their armies, and they encamped against Gibeon and made war against it. And these nations came up to fight against Gibeon because they were defectors. They had switched teams mid-game. And Gibeon does the only thing that sounds logical at this point. They cry out to Joshua and Israel for help. And what does Joshua and Israel do? Well, they keep their word. Because remember last week they made a promise. And so their promises, God holds promises in high esteem. And so because they had made a promise, they were going to keep it. That's what we see in verses 1 through 7. But it's what is said in verse 8 that I really want to draw attention to. We read it earlier. Because verse 8 says, And the Lord said to Joshua, Don't be afraid of them. For I have given them into your hands. Not a man of them shall stand before you. Five kingdoms were coming against Joshua and the nation of Israel. And God said, Don't be afraid. None of them is going to stand up. Have you ever had the Lord speak to you in your life in some way? And tell you not to fear. Have you ever had him say, well, don't worry. I've got this. I've had several times in my life where that happened. One was when Ethan was born. Kimberly was in the hospital and Ethan was struggling in the womb. And every time they, had, uh, every time they would increase the Pitocin, his heart rate would go up. And they said, well, that's not good. And after several hours of doing that, the doctor came and said, I don't know why, but I think we need to go in there and get him. See, there's a lot of gray area in that, isn't there? I don't know why. There's no specific reason why we need to go other than the fact that the baby is struggling, but we got to go in and get him. But God said, I got this, and he did. Ethan was born fine. Then when the lives came, and after he was born, Kimberly was in the hospital, and her blood pressure skyrocketed to such numbers I've never seen before. And I was sitting there visiting with her after the baby had been cleaned up, and I heard the nurses at the bottom of the bed whispering amongst themselves, saying, you know, we've given her the medicine. I'm not real sure what else to do. Let's look at the book. And I'm thinking to myself, there's a book? You know, that's not a real good thing to hear when your wife is laying there with really high blood pressure. I know they're just doing their jobs, but it's never good when you have a situation like that and your provider says, let's look at the book. But God said, I got this, and he did. Have you ever been there before? I'm sure many of us have. And then please tell me why was, it you could, why was it that you could trust God in the first place when he said, I got that? Was it blind faith that you could trust God? No, because you know better than a Christian that blind faith isn't really something that works very well because you know who God is and what he's capable of doing. So it's not a blind faith. You know who you believe in. So was it wishful thinking that you could trust God? I do think wishful thinking plays a part, but I don't think that's the whole answer because if we relegate our lives only to wishful thinking, then what happens when we don't get what we want? Well, we go to someone else who's a wish granter in our minds and we ask them for what we want, don't we? So what is it then that makes us able to trust God in the first place? You ever thought about that? I believe that it's because God has prepared us for just such a moment to say, Lord, I trust you. He has done things in our life. He has been faithful in the past. He has been true to his word. And so we know that we are honest with ourselves. And just as the old hymn goes, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. We are persuaded because the argument has already been won for us, hasn't it? Because God has proven himself faithful time and time again. That's how he works. That's how he prepares us for the battles to come. But then what is our part to do? Only to believe in him and trust and then live out that belief, isn't it? So have you been there before? I believe you have, so I know you know what I'm talking about. God prepares us for the battle that is going to come, and they will come if we don't only pay attention to how he's preparing us. Which leads to God's power in the battle. What does God's power have to do in the midst of the battle? Well, you see, there was a young boy who was traveling on an airplane one time. 
to visit his grandparents, and he sat beside a man who, was, who happened to be a seminary professor. The boy was reading a Sunday school take-home paper, and the professor thought that he would, be, he would have some fun with the little boy. So he said, young man, if you can tell me something God can do, I will give you a big shiny apple. This is another old joke, by the way. I will give you a big shiny apple. The boy thought for a moment and then replied, Mister, if you can tell me something God can't do, I'll give you a whole barrel of apples. <laughs> Have you really thought about that question? Is there anything that God can't do, cannot do? Have you ever said, have you ever said, God, can you really do this? Whatever it is that you're asking him to do, have you ever asked yourself or thought to yourself, God, are you able to do this? Can you do this? Because I believe that in some ways that we all have asked that question of God a time or two in the past, whether we meant to or not. It's called doubt. But after seeing God work in your life, and I hope everyone here has seen God work in their lives, have you ever asked the question like the boy did in that last illustration, is there anything that God cannot do? Because that's the question we need to ask, isn't it? Is there anything that he cannot do? And the answer would be what? No. There's nothing that he cannot do. Why? Why would the answer be no to that question? Well, it's simple. Because when God works, he works in such ways that you have no doubt that it is him that is going to work. In other words, when God moves, people take notice, don't they? Because they can't explain it otherwise. People have had things happen in their lives that they just don't have an explanation for, and the only thing they're left to say is God must have done something. Right? Now, I'm going to move pretty quickly through the rest of this, this section of the text here because it's, it's a narrative. It's a story. It's talking about this battle. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on the battle, but I want to draw out some, a couple of key points here. First is that Gibeon called to Joshua and Israel for help. And so in verse 7, our Bible tells us that Joshua and the men of war came up from Gilgal. And we read the verse earlier that, that said where the Lord had again reminded Joshua to not be afraid that none of these men would be able to stand before them. Then in verse 9, we see that Joshua and the army marched all night to meet the opposing army. Then verse 10 says what? Who threw them into panic? Was it Joshua and the men of Israel? No, they were there. They were a part of it. But who was it? Verse 10 gives us the answer. Verse 10 says, The Lord who struck them with a great blow and chased them by the way of the, uh, by the way of ascent of Beth Horn and struck them as far as Azekah and Machida. God was the one who was doing something here, the Bible says. And I'm sure he was using the soldiers from Israel to chase all these men away. But there is something here in verse 11. Some people say, well, it really wasn't God. It was just the opposing... It was just Israel and Joshua, man. Those guys were so fierce, and they were so scary. They were really the ones that were driving these people away. But in verse 11, there's something that tells us here that it was God who did this, because in verse 11, this is what it says. And as they fled before Israel, all these opposing armies, while they were going down by the way of Beth Horon, we saw that just a minute ago, it says the Lord threw down large stones from heaven on them as far as Azekah, and they died. There were, and it says this, and there were more that died by the hailstones than being struck with the sword. So as the enemy was fleeing God, God rained down on them hailstones. We've seen hailstones before. Those are little pea-sized things, sometimes a little bit bigger. They can be annoying. Sometimes they crack windows, they crack glass from your cars. Here, they're big enough to kill a man. And the Bible says they killed a lot, more than Israel killed. So who was doing the fighting? God. And it gets better. Verses 12 to 14 of our Bible says this. And at that time, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel. And he said, in the sight of all Israel, everybody saw him do this. This is what Joshua said. Sun stand still at Gibeon and moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun, guess what? Stood still. And the moon stopped. And so the nation took vengeance on their enemies. And the Bible goes on and says, this is written in another book, it's not included in the Bible, but it's the book of Jashar. The sun stopped in the midst of heaven and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. Can you imagine that? For a whole day. And it says there's never been a day like it before or since when the Lord heeded the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. 
You see, at that time, the fighting wasn't over. The day was getting close to an end. And Joshua likely knew that if the day dragged on into nightfall, that his enemies would get away from him. So what does he do? He calls out to the sun and the moon in the name of God. And what happens is that they stop moving. It's almost as if time stops staying still. How is it possible? I don't know. The Bible says it happened, though, for about the space of a whole day. And why? Because it is so Israel could take vengeance on their enemies. Now, when you think about all that, the only thing I can draw from that is that God is pretty powerful, isn't he? The Bible describes him as all-powerful. He's able to make the sun and moon stop. He's able to make time stop. He's able to make great churns stop. Great chunks of ice fall out of the sky and land on his enemies and kill them. And so just like that little boy, try and name something that God cannot do. And you will spend all day trying to think of something because there is nothing that God cannot do except for one thing. What is that? Sin. To declare otherwise is to claim that God is not really who he says it is. It's to declare that God is not God. So God then is powerful. And he will fight for you. He will fight for us. In fact, if we do a search in the Bible of just any phrases where it talks about God fighting for us, this is, these are just a few of what you will find. Exodus 15, three, chapter 3, verse 6 says this, The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. The Lord is a warrior, isn't he? Isaiah 42, 13, The Lord goes out like a mighty man. Not a weak man. Like a man of war, he stirs up his zeal. He cries out, he shouts aloud. He shows himself mighty against his foes. Then in Isaiah 52, 12, he says this, For you shall not go out in haste, and you shall not go in flight, for the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. So he's in front of you and behind you. And then Psalm 138, 7, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. That's just a few of the many that are listed in the Bible, which basically says what? That God is powerful and that he will fight for you. And he prepares us to experience that power by then working in our lives, building trust and faith in us to lead up to that day or days when we're really going to need it. And we are going to need those days. We are going to need that trust. Because the world is getting darker every day, every year. And it's so easy to fall into that trap of asking the question, then is, is there any hope? Have you heard that question before? Is there any hope? If you have been paying attention to God in your life, then you can answer the yes to that question, can't you? You can say, yes, God is going to fight for me. And someone says, well, why? Why would God fight for you? Because he's been faithful to do so in the past. That's a testimony, isn't it? It's real easy to share with somebody else. God has done this for me in the past. I trust him for the future. How hard is that? Our only part is to be obedient because he's been faithful to us. We need to be obedient to him and trust what he says that he will do. Look at verse 16 with me. Do you remember those five kings who got this whole mess started in the beginning? All those ones I couldn't pronounce their names of very well. When we look at verses 16 to 19 with me, this is what the Bible says. These five kings fled and hid in a cave. These five kings who got everything started, who were men of renown, men who were leading their armies, what did they do? When the time got tough, they went and hid in a cave. In verse 18, and Joshua said, Roll large stones against the mouth of the cave and set men back to guard it, but the rest of you keep on fighting because they're not that important. Pursue your enemies, attack their rear guard. Do not let them enter their cities, for the Lord your God has given them into your hands. These five kings, who were of the seemingly important kingdoms of the promised land, became so scared that they went and hid themselves in a cave, hoping to avoid detection. Those things that trouble you in your life, when they, are go, when they go up against God, what are they forced to do? They go and hide, don't they? Because they're up against a superior enemy. These kings went into a cave to hope to avoid being detected, but it did not work. They were found out, and Joshua had the cave blocked, so they couldn't get out. And then he tells the people to keep on fighting, to keep on pursuing their enemies, doing what the Lord has led you to do. And they did that until the end of the day. And when they came back to the cave, this is what happened in 24 through 27. 
It says, And when their brothers came down to Joshua, Joshua summoned all the men of Israel and said to the chiefs of the men of war who had gone with them, These are the captains, these are the lieutenants, these are the generals, all those people in our modern day language. He says, Come near, put your feet on the necks of these kings. And then they came near and put their feet on their necks. And then Joshua said this, Do not be afraid or dismayed. Be strong and courageous, for thus the Lord will do to all your enemies against whom you fight. And then afterward he put them to death and buried them in the cave after hanging them on the trees. Now I want you to understand something here in this text for today. I want you to understand that sometimes the enemies that we fight are very big, aren't they? They can be really scary. We may not have the answer of, of, to what we are facing when we face it. We may not know, and so we can be apprehensive. We don't know what to think. But with God on your side, they really aren't that big at all, are they? Look at what Joshua did here. He brought those five kings out, these troublemakers, and had the commanders of the army of Israel, each one come and put their feet on their necks. It meant that they were laying flat on the ground on their bellies, and these men would come up and stand on their necks. Can you imagine how humiliating that must have been for those kings? And then he said, don't be afraid. Be strong and courageous. Why? Because the Lord's going to do the same thing to your enemies that you fight against. That big, ugly, that big, ugly thing that you're facing isn't so big and menacing anymore when God's on your side, isn't it? Those five kings who stirred up all this strife, all this trouble, who brought together their five kingdoms to fight against Joshua and Israel, these men who were the figureheads for each of their kingdoms, they were famous men. They were men of, men of renown. I mean, they were kings. They weren't just some little peasant guy off the street. They were, the people looked at them as being representative of their kingdom. And so these men who came out strong were now lying on the ground with the leaders of the army of Israel literally standing on their heads. Can you imagine what sight that must have been? In case you don't get it, that's a symbolic picture. That's a picture of what God can do when we first trust him and then follow through with obedience. God is not only going to defeat our enemies, but he's going to have us standing on their heads. The Bible says that when that Joshua killed those kings and had their bodies tossed back into the very cave that they were hiding in, the place that they were seeking refuge, and they, and they permanently sealed the, this cave with stones. And then in verse 28, he says this, As for Makedah, because that's where they, these kings were put to death, it says Joshua captured it on that day and struck it in its king with the edge of the sword. He devoted to destruction every person in it. He left none remaining, and he did to the king of Makedah just as he had done to the king of Jericho. So look how those words are used there in that verse. They came to the city, they captured it, they killed everybody with the sword, and he did to that king as he did to the king of Jericho. Remember Jericho from a while way back. So there's a formula there. Do you see it? Look at verse 29. It repeats itself. Joshua and all of Israel with them passed home from Machado, and they went through Libna, and they did everything exactly the same. Verses 31 through 32. Joshua and all of Israel passed on from Libna to Lachish, and they did everything exactly the same, just as they'd done. And the cycle repeats itself again and again and again, where Joshua and Israel, when they came to a city, they totally annihilated it. Even this little guy in verse 33, this little horn, king of Gezer, he came up to help Lachish. And our Bible says this, and Joshua struck him and his people until none were left. Why is all of this happening? And this great, tremendous battle was simple because, as the Bible says, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Israel. If you ask me what I thought this chapter was about, do you know what I would say? It's about a people learning to trust their God, walking in obedience, and then God fighting on their side. That's it. Very simple. Joshua and the people really don't have a lot to do here, do they? Time and time again, the Bible says, the Lord did this and the Lord did that. Yet Joshua and the army was there, and yes, they fought. But who ultimately did the victory belong to? Who is he referred to in this chapter in the Bible? The victory is referred to as belonging to God because he's the one that was fighting. But why did he fight so hard for Israel? Because it's like the old hymn, Trust in the Bay, says, if you know that hymn, right? It says, not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but his smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt or a fear, not a sigh or a tear can abide while we what? Trust and obey. Many times it can be as simple as that. Are we really trusting? 
I think if we poll Christians in America today, that most would answer in the affirmative that they were. They would say, yeah, I'm trusting God. Yes, I believe he's got the whole world in the palm of his hand. I believe if I ask anybody on the street who claimed to be a Christian, if I ask them that question, that they would give me pretty much that exact answer. But here's the thing. What they fail to realize is that that word trust is really a two-part word. The other part is their action. Think of it like this. If you look at a fireman, what do you think about a fireman? You can say things like this, man, we trust them because when we're in a fix, we want them to help, don't we? If the building I'm in is on fire, then I want a fireman to come and rescue me, right? Why? Because they know what they're doing. They're trained. They go through all this training for these things. But you can say this all day long, and it sounds really good, but it's in the heat of the moment when actions really speak louder than words. For instance, because if your building is on fire, and that fireman that you looked at the day before, whom you looked at and says, I trust that fireman, if he comes in and tells you to take his hands, if he asks you to trust him, but you don't, are you really living up to what you said earlier? The truth is that if you don't take his hand, then you don't really trust him because you are more afraid of the fire. And you can't get your eyes off of it. Or you don't really believe that the firefighter is capable of helping you in the first place. You see, many Christians claim to trust in Jesus, but where are their actions to prove it? Are they more afraid of the circumstances that they are in, or do they not think he is qualified? Do they not think God is qualified enough to do what he said that he will do, according to what he, how he says it in the Bible? Which leads to God's provision for after the time. Look at verses 40 through 43 with me quickly. It says, So Joshua struck the whole land, the hill country, and the Negev, and the little land, and the slopes, and all the kings. He left none remaining but devoted to destruction, all that breathed, just as the Lord God of Israel commanded. And Joshua struck them from Kadesh Barnea as far as Gaza, and all the country of Goshen as far as Gibeon. And Joshua captured all these kings in the land at one time. Because the Lord God of Israel far from Israel. And then Joshua returned and all Israel with them to the camp at Gilgal. So this is the conclusion of this entire battle. Joshua and the army of Israel struck the whole land of the south. They captured all their kings and put them to death. And they captured the whole land. But how did they do it? Verse 42 says it was because the Lord God of Israel fought for Israel. It wasn't by their strength or their own might that they did this. It was solely because the Lord fought for them, and they took possession of the land in the south. There's more battles to come later, but this is the first big battle where they conquered all of the south. And this is important to note because if we remember all the way back to Abraham, and we remember Abraham, don't we? What was God's promise to Abraham? This is God's provision here. What was God's promise to Abraham? Well, he promised Abraham several things, didn't he? He promised one that his name would be great. And it is to this day, you say, I am a child of Abraham. He promised also that his children would be a sand on the seashore without number. You can't count the numbers of the Jews, and they've all been born from Abraham. He's got a tremendous family tree. Number three, God promised Abraham that all nations of the world would be blessed by his seed. And we see that in Jesus Christ. The one I want to focus on right here is this. He says that he would be given a land for possession. His children would inherit a land for possession. And that's important because land in ancient times was very important. If you had a homeland, then you had a place of belonging. That you, you had a place to call home. There's never really no different today, is it? People have land and houses, and on that land, they, <clears throat> they have land and they have houses on that land because they want to call that place home. But here's the thing about all of that. Here today and gone tomorrow. Right? I'm not talking about the land, I'm talking about you. <laughs> you're here today, but you're gone tomorrow. That which we accumulate, be it a big house, lots of land, cars, trucks, or maybe you don't have any of those things. Maybe all you have is a great stamp collection. It doesn't matter. Either way, the truth remains that naked can you.